Today's video is the second of my two-part series on the QNAP basics. Today we're going to go a little bit deeper into many of the settings and options so that you'll be able to get the most out of your QNAP. Like we did in part one, we'll touch on what these functions mean, any recommendations, and any security implications. If you haven't already done so, then please consider subscribing and select that notifications icon so you'll be notified of any new content. So picking up from the last video, first thing I want to do is get into storage and snapshots and cover a couple things that probably aren't super obvious. So most of this is configured during your initial setup. So your RAID arrays and your hard drive configuration, all that stuff is already set up. What probably isn't set up is a few other of the buried options. So let's start out by going to global settings up here. And the first thing I want to talk about is the resync priority. So by default, this is set to medium. Yeah, what I usually do is I usually set mine to high. And the reason for that is if you do have a drive replacement, you want that drive to be rebuilt, or I want that drive to be rebuilt as fast as possible. The default is, as I mentioned, is medium. And that works perfectly well. But in my case, I'm not hitting this thing with, I'm just not in a business environment, and I'm not nailing it with terabytes and terabytes every single day. My preference is to get that redundancy and health back into my RAID. So I set it as fast as possible, let the CPU dominate the rebuild and get it done as quickly as possible. It's your choice how you do it. Just understand that the lower you set it, the longer it takes. Sliding down a little further, there's a couple other things I want to talk about. Um, first off is RAID scrubbing. RAID scrubbing is basically rebuilding your array it's for integrity. So it's making sure that everything is aligned and it's something that you can set on a schedule. So you can go ahead and click the schedule, set it to monthly, weekly, whatever you want. Just be aware that when you set it, your entire array will rebuild, which can take some time. So again, depending on the combination of your resync priority and your RAID scrubbing schedule, you if you set it to monthly, there'll probably be one to one and a half days a month where your NAS is tied up, basically going through your array. My recommendation is you at least scrub it once in a while. Um, it's always it's always better to set a timer and forget about it. And lastly, if you do have SSDs, obviously this is a trim schedule. You can you can um, schedule that to run usually daily, just to trim up your SSDs. Um, on my other NAS, I have four SSDs, so that's really helpful on those. This particular device, even though it's scheduled on, there are no SSDs in this device. And the last thing I want to talk about is file system check. Now, most of the time you don't need to do that, but if you want to run a file system check, it, don't, it doesn't take that long. Um, again, you can set this at, at a certain certain time. So, if, so I can set it to run at that particular time, or I can set it to run now. Again, you don't have to do this. It's an option that you can. Now, the disk service got a couple options that might be interesting to you. And the one that's always interesting to me is setting the threshold temperatures. So most of this on, is on by default, but you can customize these particular settings to um, enable temperature alarms for certain temps for both hard drives and solid states. And the option that we probably uh, want to make sure you're on, especially if you're running an expansion unit, is to check for firmware on login. Now, I choose to not share my data with QNAP, but that's totally up to you. And then snapshots, we're going to skip because that's an entirely new video. And I'll post a couple links to some good choices to watch from QNAP directly at QNAP UK um, to take a look at you know, how to best use snapshots. A couple other things I want to talk about while we're in storage and snapshots. First is ex external storage devices. So if you have an expansion box or any type of RAID box attached to it that's part of your pool or that is a pool, it will show up here under storage or external storage device management. I don't have any expansion boxes attached to this unit, but um, I've actually taken it out of service to rebuild. But if, it, if you did have it, it would show up here. Um, one last thing is external storage. So under external storage, as you can see that I have a T7 SSD drive attached to it. Now this is shareable typically through the admin account. 
makes it really useful if you need to back up or copy things to and from um, your external storage without actually sharing it to the rest of the world. So if we go on here, we can actually go into the file manager. We can see the T7 and we can create a folder. I just call it test and there's our folder. And once you created the folder, you can share this. A lot of different options, but typically the scenario would be to share to a NAS user. So you can go ahead and click on NAS user and actually configure who you want to share that particular folder with. So the next section I want to cover is the license center. This is something that you may or may not have used already. And basically this lists all the license that you've purchased. Um, it also gives you the option to recover any licenses you may have. And there's a software store. So if you do want to go out and procure some more licenses, you can. As you can see, you can buy everything from the media sign player to the uh, face recognition for QBR. QBR Pro, the XFAT driver, and so on. Surveillance station licenses. So all these are available. And the last one is the license manager itself. This shows you kind of what you've already purchased and it gives you the option to install them or re-download them. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for all your license needs. So the next thing I want to talk about is the privilege settings. So under the privilege settings, you probably have already messed with this somewhat. We'll go through a couple of things that you may or may not know. So the first thing it does is actually list all of the current users that you have on your system. Um, obviously, you have the ability to create users, and you can decide whether or not you want to home, use the home folder option. This isn't something I actually use. It's not a bad way to go. So what it does is it creates a home folder for each user by default so that you can put all of their files there. I'm a little bit of a control freak, so I prefer to have the folders dedicated to what I need. So I disable the home folder option, and I just create folders for each of my users and make that their default directory. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is user groups. Now, user groups can be pretty powerful, especially if you got two or three or four or ten users in your current situation, because it allows you to create properties and settings for the entire group. So if I click on create, I can give it a group name, and then I can go ahead and assign users to it. And of course, once you have the user, uh, the user group created, you can actually go and edit all of the folders and permissions that you're allowing that particular group to have. So it's kind of really powerful in terms of getting, you know, a lot of settings instead of doing it two or three or four times, you can just do it to one group and call it a day. The next thing I want to talk about is actual quotas. If you click on quota, you will be able to enable quota for all users. And then once you do that, it, you'll be able to create a default value. So if I click on enable quota, I can actually give it some kind of uh, 500 gigs. And when I apply this, what it will allow me to do, it will create all the, it will create this allocation space for all the users. But what it also allows me to do is if I go back up to users and click account profile, you see where it says quota is disabled. That would now show up and you can actually adjust the quota for that particular user. Now I don't use quotas because I have plenty of space, so I'm not super worried about it. You know, or if you're putting this in a small business environment, the quota can come in pretty handy. Okay, so the next section I want to cover under network and file services is the WinMac NFS section. And this is where you're going to enable file services. Now, most of you are either on a Mac or a Windows PC, I assume. And I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there on Linux as well. But accordingly, you're going to enable the service that you want. For me, it's Microsoft Networking. So I'm going to enable file service for Microsoft networking. I'm going to give it a name and I want to make sure that it's on the right work group. Accordingly, if you're, you have a lot of Apple devices in your house, Mac, MacBook Pros, you can enable the AFP, the Apple file protocol on your NAS as well. You can also enable NFS service if you'd like. So again, it all depends on what environment you're putting this in. I would assume for most of us, we're going to at least have to have Windows networking in, in, enabled. So you want to make sure that you've got that turned on so that it can discover these devices. And the last thing I want to cover, in, at least in this section, is the network recycle bin. Now, this one 
it's pretty useful. So I guess it depends on how you use your devices and so on. But this basically allows you to create a network recycle bin for every shared folder that you create. So that if a user does accidentally deletes things, um, they'll be located in the network recycle bin. Now you do still have the option to enable or disable them on a folder by folder basis, but this is a global setting. So if I turn this on, it's gonna create, every time I create a shared folder, it's gonna set up a recycle bin. I'll give you an example of what it looks like in the file settings. So if we go to shared folders, and I'm just gonna go here to my USB import folder. We'll do the edit properties. And if we look here, we have the option of disabling that that uh, recycle bin. So, you know, again, this is one of these things where you, you probably wanna set it on for global settings and then individually turn them off where you don't think you need them. There are cases like for me, it's movie folders and things like that. I don't wanna enable the recycle bin on those big, large files like that. To me, it's not all that useful. So it depends on what folders you're creating and what you're gonna use them for. So the next section I wanna talk about is actually has to do with the multimedia console. And the multimedia console actually manages your, your um, data. For example, all your photos, creating the thumbnails, creating thumbnails for video, things like that. And this is where you actually configure all of that. The first thing you obviously have to do is enable it. If you don't enable it, it's not gonna do what you want, but you have to also know how to configure it because you don't necessarily want it to try to index everything that's on your NAS unit. You just want to be specific about what folders you want to be able to control. So if you go click under content management, you'll see currently the applications that are that on at least on my this particular NAS that are using, which is PhotoStation and the DLNA server. Now the PhotoStation is really the only one I'm usually concerned with. And there's many other programs on their web store that can utilize the multimedia console. But the key here is how to configure it. You can see right here that I have two folders that are highlighted that are currently being managed. And so therefore it's indexing, it's creating thumbnails, it's doing all the multimedia management. So if I actually click on edit, I can see a list of my folders. And from there I can define which ones I want. Now, I may not want them. The default is the multimedia folder, and they kind of expect you to put all your stuff there. I don't particularly like that. As I mentioned, I'm kind of a control freak, and I want to know where things are and what they're doing. So I'll pick my own fo photos folder and, and do the things I need to do, um, and I want to do it in the way that I want to do it. So you can select your folders, click Apply, and it's basically going to manage those folders going forward. So when you do click on a program like PhotoStation or DLNA server or one of the other three or four multimedia programs, you'll be able to actually get the results you're looking for. Anyway, that's about it for this video and I hope you found it useful. There are a whole lot more functions and settings in a QNAP unit, so feel free to leave a comment if there's something that you really wanna see. If you haven't done so, please subscribe. And thanks again for watching. I'll see you on the next video.